Oh, thanks very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today um, for these two days, actually, and to have the chance to, to sit and uh, listen to um, some really, really fantastic presentations um, and to get to come to talk to you today about um, uh, one of my favourite topics, uh, emerging digital technologies. I mean, we, we're living in, a, uh, in the middle of a revolution, though the world is currently in, in the middle of, of a revolution in a very real sense. We're living in times of unprecedented rapid change, and the change is driven by the impact on the world of digital technologies. Since the creation of the widespread access to the internet, the invention of the World Wide Web in 1990, we've started to see transformations in virtually every aspect of our everyday lives, the way we live and the way we work. And these changes are brought about by an unprecedented technological revolution. So what I'd like to do uh, for the next hour is um, spend some time talking to you about the legal implications and the policy implications of that from the point of view of, uh, of liability and safety, um, particularly when it comes to the way in which that technology uh, becomes part of the products that form part of our everyday lives. So I'll spend some time thinking about what are these things that we call emerging, emerging digital technologies, what are we talking about? Um, I'll um, help us start to think about some of the key issues that arise um, within our existing uh, legal regimes from a safety and a liability perspective, some of the challenges in dealing with those. We'll talk a little bit about the way forward, and I'd love to hear any, um, any questions and insights that, that you have uh, in, into some of these issues. So um, uh, please be ready, uh, ready with your questions, and it would be great to sort of thrash around some of these issues uh, once we, we get through the presentation. But there are three features of this, this revolution that I think are important for today's discussion. The first is that it's global. Now, for sure, there are some communities in the world that will have better access to these technologies than others, so it's not a level playing field by any sense in, in the way in which this revolution is manifesting itself. But it is a revolution that doesn't respect national borders. On the contrary, it surpasses political and geographical borders and, in fact, brings the world together in many ways, for better and for worse. And by its nature, it's an informational revolution. The revolution is grounded on building technologies that multiply our abilities to gather, process, and to share information. Everything flows from this basic principle. It's all about the way in which we, uh, we gather access and deal with information. And the third point is that the, the pace of change is fast, really fast, and it's accelerating. When it comes to inventions based on modern digital technologies, time frames from conception to delivery to redundancy are often measured in, in months or sometimes even weeks rather than in decades or years. The pace of change is part of what is creating the real legal challenges and I'd say the anxiety on the part of the policymakers as to what is the appropriate response and whether legislative change is needed in, in response to what we're dealing with. So what are, what are these emerging di digital technologies? Well, I think we can think about it as basically the collection of, of, of these broad, broad types of technologies. First, there's the Internet of Things, connected products, products that are connected to the Internet and products that are connected to, them, to each other uh, via the Internet. We call that the Internet of Things. It's artificial intelligence and machine learning, whatever that might mean. Uh, autonomous machines and robotics. Uh, the world of virtual reality and augmented reality that's, that's, um, that's here and on the near horizon. 3D printing is another aspect, uh, and maybe even blockchain, and certainly there's a lot of discussion within the product safety community about the role of blockchain, um, uh, in, including in, in the role that might play in, in ensuring safety uh, in, our, in our supply chains. And then, of course, there, there are technologies that are being developed uh, in parts of the world now uh, behind closed doors that, that are yet to emerge that, that perhaps we can't, we can't even imagine. Um, uh, applications, applications of this information technology and digital technologies that, um, uh, that, that, are, that are yet unthought of and are yet part of our imagination that, that, that may become reality uh, we, uh, within, within a foreseeable period of time. And it's those aspects, aspects, aspects as well that are playing part of the, uh, the policy discussion uh, because the poli poli policy response now needs to take account not only of, we know of what we know now about technology, but also what is just around the corner. 
And, then, and of course, these. Um, I'll just go back a bit. Um, uh, the, the, these are not discrete groups of, of technologies. These technologies are interrelated and, and are very commonly sort of inter, interrelated in products. For example, we might take a 3D printer. The 3D printer is a, it will be a connected product. It will be part of the Internet of Things. Uh, it, it may well rely upon um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to do, to do what it does um, in, in, in the future. So these categories of technologies uh, are not independent of each other, but they're very much interrelated and in, interconnected um, as we move into the real world. So when it comes to questions of product liability and product safety regulation, uh, these technologies are starting to raise some real questions for policymakers, for, law, for lawyers and for regulators around the world. Uh, the issue is being raised and debated in many, many forums. Uh, uh, it's under consideration, for example, within the OECD Committee on Consumer Policy, not least within the Working Party on Product Safety that exists within the OECD, uh, where the governments that are members of that org organisation will sit around and talk about product safety issues and new and emerging technologies is very much part of just the discussion within that, that, uh, that working party. Um, at a European Commission level, uh, Paolo has already um, given us some insight into the way in which the European Commission is starting to uh, think, about, uh, think about new technologies and the policy response, including from the point of view of product regulation uh, and, what, and, and how, uh, how is the European Commission going to deal with those issues moving forward. Um, and the work, the work of the newly formed expert group on liability and new technologies is going to be a very important part of, uh, of how we see uh, a, a policy response to these issues moving forward. So let's have a look at some of the specific issues uh, that arise when we, when we think about liability law and product regulatory law. Um, and the product liability directive is, is very much in focus. Um, and one of the key issues that arises is the very fundamental question of what is a product, because some of these new technologies challenge um, that, that very concept. Uh, within our product liability directive that has been with us uh, since 1985, in fact, it, uh, it was um, um, uh, conceived as a policy uh, objective some 10 years before it was adopted. It, the, the directive that we have now uh, was the result of t 10 years of um, active and uh, in so at some times very controversial debate about whether it would, it would just change, um, uh, uh, change the whole landscape in Europe and turn Europe into a litigation hotbed. Um, since the directive has been in place, that hasn't happened, and by and large the directive has been regarded as um, a very successful um, uh, uh, piece of European legislation that does deliver an appropriate balance um, uh, in protecting the respective interests, the interests of consumers uh, to, um, to be safe and to be compensated when injured by defective products and the, and the interests of industry uh, and, and insurers in not being faced with, um, with uncontrolled liability. So the, the directive has stood the test of time. Uh, ironically, um, if you look in the um, preamble to the directive, it talks about it being introduced at the time to take account of developments in technology. So uh, it's intended to be um, a response to new technologies as, as that was known to the world in 1984-85. Uh, in um, uh, but I think it's fair to say, uh, over time, having been subjected to, uh, to reviews every five years since, um, it has um, uh, repeatedly uh, proved itself to be um, a, a piece of legislation that achieves its objectives in, in, in terms of achieving uh, the right balance between the respective parties. But there are some real questions now over whether that's going to be right for the future. And the current um, round of review of the Product Liability Directive has had that specific focus. Is it, is, it, um, is it fit for purpose taking into account these new technologies that I've been speaking about? Um, so, um, and so one of, yeah, one of the interesting questions is, do, do these new technologies challenge the concept of what is a product? Uh, this is the definition um, uh, uh, that you see here. Uh, that, that is in the current uh, product liability directive, and fundamentally it describes a product as a movable. That's, 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 that's the, the, the crux of it. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and there's also, the, we'll, we'll come back to the, the reference to a product including electricity. Um, now, one of the questions that Paolo's already touched on is uh, where does software fit, fit within that? And, uh, and that's, in fact, one of, the, um, uh, one of the hot topics that's being debated within the, within the expert group um, uh, on liability and new technologies at this very moment. Is, is, is software a product? Now, to my mind, uh, that's not really the right question to ask because 
always, always in these discussions, when we're talking about new technologies and the policy response, I think it's very important to always relate, relate it to the real world, to the practical applications. Um, it's very easy to have academic debates about these issues um, and to dream up scenarios in which the law is going to struggle to find the right answer. Uh, but the, you know, the important questions need to be grounded in the real, the real world. So, when we, so it's not really right to ask, is, is software a product? But I think it's, it's right to think about particular scenarios. And there are a number of scenarios in which this question does arise. Uh, um, and that's because software does appear and, and is used in, in different ways. Um, the, f the first way is, is, is the embedded software, the software that, um, uh, that is supplied with products um, that, uh, that in many cases um, is responsible for the way in which that, that product operates. This could be the software driving the engine management, management system within your motor vehicle. It can be the operating system within your computer. Or your, or your tablet or your, or your phone, or it could be some software that's now built into your oven or your um, refrigerator or, or, or your kettle, uh, and software provided uh, with a product that's embedded in the product and is responsible for the way the product works is one, is one type of software. Um, and I think many of us, uh, most of us, could be quite comfortable with the notion that that software is part of the supplied product, and if the software is defective that makes the product perform dangerously and somebody gets injured, then um, intellectually there seems to be not much difficulty in accepting that that would be very much part of uh, the scope of our current product liability, product liability directive, the software as part of the product um, uh, is, um, is, is within scope, so if, if the software is defective then uh, then the, the product liability directive is triggered. Um, it becomes a bit more difficult when we take into account the fact that that software can be updated. So when the manufacturer might push out update, updates to that software to make the product perform better, to deal with a security issue, um, etc. Uh, so that's software that wasn't supplied with the product, but software that was supplied at a later point of time. Now, if that updated software has a defect that causes the product to, the, to malfunction, uh, then we start to move into the world where it becomes a bit more uncertain. Uh, and is that a situation where the product liability directive is triggered? You know, what is the product that we're talking about in that situation? Uh, it probably has to be the software if we're going to activate the product liability directive. Is that software immovable? Um, some will say software in that sense is immovable. It gets transferred from the, um, uh, gets transferred from the manufacturer to the, to the consumer. Um, it, it's not a tangible product as such, but, uh, uh, but it's something that, that comfortably falls within the concept of immovable. That's, that's, what, that's what some people say. Um, others will say, well, no, that's not, that's not quite right. There does need to be some sense of tangibility around this um, in order for it to make sense, because otherwise, otherwise where, where does it end? Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the directive, uh, the definition of product in the directive um, makes it clear, we'll just go back to it, um, that a product includes electricity. So some will say, okay, well, there's an indication uh, that the concept of a product and the concept of a movable doesn't have to be tangible. If it can be electricity, why can't it be the software that's, uh, that's downloaded via, uh, via the internet? Others are saying, well, no, that's not the way in which you interpret legislation. Uh, the fact that the drafters of the legislation had to make it clear that product includes electricity uh, by, um, uh, by that very fact is an indication that otherwise electricity would not be considered a product. So we have this kind of debate going uh, into how these particular provisions are going to be interpreted and it's quite important because it then determines whether or not uh, software by its nature uh, is capable of being considered immovable because if it's not then it can't be considered within the scope of the current product liability directive. And of course, we have software appearing and affecting our lives in other ways. And we have the, the classic sort of non-embedded non software. And I think the best example to think of is, you know, are, are the apps that you download onto your, uh, onto your phones. Um, now, um, as I said, some might say those, those apps are obviously movables. The, um, they're um, purchased from the, from the app store um, and, uh, uh, and downloaded on the phone. And those apps are capable of causing injury, particularly apps, you know, for example, apps that might give us 
physical directions. Um, navigation, navigation apps may send us into a dangerous situation and we might get injured. Um, apps increasingly are delivering health information and may, and may cause us to make decisions about our personal health and well-being that may end up being harmful if, those, if that information isn't correct. So uh, these apps can certainly uh, cause us injury. Uh, it happens through the device um, that we use, uh, but it's not the device that's defective. There's nothing wrong with the phone. The phone has um, performed exactly as intended, and as you would expect, it's delivered the information that the app provider has intended to give to you, um, but it's that information. Uh, that, uh, that has caused the harm. So again, that, there are some that, that are saying, well, look, it's very obvious, software is immovable, uh, it fits within the definition, and if you're injured by an app and it, because the app's defective, then, then it's very obvious that the product liability directive is triggered. Uh, but if we accept that principle, uh, then we're sort of very quickly into the world of treating information as a product. Uh, and that then takes us into a much more sort of controversial area because you have to start asking where, where, where do you stop? Uh, because fundamentally in the circumstances I've described, um, it wasn't a physical thing that injured, the, injured us, it was the um, uh, defective information that was provided through the app. And if we're going to open the door to defective information being a product, then it doesn't stop at software, it doesn't stop at apps. Uh, and it, that, uh, that rationale uh, can manifest itself in many, many ways. So these are issues that are not easy to resolve and, and frankly, uh, to sit down and, um, and redraft the product liability directive is that if, if that's where this ends up, um, uh, would, not, would not be an easy task because uh, uh, these, are, these, these are fine distinctions and, uh, and to have a sort of co coherent piece of legislation that's going to be fit for the future um, is, um, is going to be critically, crit critically important. So if we try to be too prescriptive about what's a product and what's not, then I think we're going to get ourselves uh, into trouble into the future. Uh, so my sense is that um, uh, at the moment amongst most stakeholders, and, and, and perhaps I say it amongst, within the European Commission, there's not a massive appetite to rewrite the product liability directive, uh, not least because everyone knows if we open up that Pandora's box, um, it's, going to, it's going to take another 10 years to, um, to resolve all of the issues that will then be put on the table. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, to perhaps, so there is some thinking that perhaps the better approach is to leave the directive as it is um, and deal with these sort of finer points of uncertainty through, through guidance and, um, and soft law. Um, uh, but yeah, but whichever, whichever way we try to approach this, the answers are not going to be found easily. And another question that arises when it comes to some of these new technologies and when those new technologies converge with products is, is the question of who is the producer of the product because our liability system and in fact our, uh, our product regu regulatory regimes are very much grounded on identifying who is, who is the individual, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the individual entity that is going to be responsible for the safety of that product when it's placed on the market uh, and for uh, compensating um, an injured person if a defect in the product causes the injury. And for traditional, traditional products, it's very, very easy to develop rules that help us, dis help us decide who is the producer, who is the manufacturer, who is the person responsible for those things. Uh, but when it comes to new technologies, uh, we're starting to get into a much more complicated world, and it particularly arises with products that are connected to each other. Um, products that are connected to the internet and becomes even more complicated when we start introducing concepts of artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning. And, and that's because um, we're moving into a world where products don't remain the same through their life cycle. Uh, we're moving into a world where a manufacturer will place a product on the market that will be perfectly fine, it will do exactly as the manufacturer intended. Um, but the way in which that product performs uh, and indeed the safety performance of that product can change over time due to inputs and data uh, and influences that product receives from third parties by design. The easiest example to think of is, is the autonomous car, um, uh, where uh, a, a car can be very well designed by the vehicle manufacturer factura, uh, and um, placed on the roads, uh, but the way in which that car actually drives um, is very, very much determined by um, what then happens around that vehicle in terms of the information it receives from various third-party sources through the life of the entire vehicle. So if that vehicle has a, uh, is involved in an accident because it, it steers in the wrong direction or doesn't brake when it should brake or brakes when it shouldn't brake, um, uh, at some stage down the track because of defects in the uh, 
infrastructure information that it receives or the, or the navigation information that it receives from a third party, uh, then who ought to be responsible for that? For a start, who should have been responsible to stop that happening in the first place? Uh, um, uh, and that's where our regulatory regime um, has the role to play. Um, and if that fails and, and it happens, the bad thing happens and somebody gets injured, then who is the person who ought to be primarily responsible for, comp for providing compensation to those who have been injured by an obvious defect? Um, and so new, tech, new digital technologies are, cha are challenging these fundamental principles. As I've said, autonomous vehicles is an obvious area where uh, this issue arises and needs to, needs to be dealt with. Uh, but this issue does manifest itself increasingly as manufacturers are placing on the market products uh, that will uh, change their performance and change their safety characteristics because of inputs and uh, because of the way they're connected to other things and because of the way they're designed to receive inputs. Uh, from, uh, from third parties uh, through the life cycle of the product. Uh, just reflecting on whether our existing regimes are, um, uh, are adequate to deal with these issues, um, our General Product Safety Directive uh, has this as part of the definition of producer. Uh, it includes other professionals in, in the supply chain, so as well as the manufacturer, uh, it's other professionals in the supply chain insofar as their activities may affect the safety properties of a product. So we can ask ourselves, well, um, other individuals, other entities that provide that information uh, uh, that influences uh, the behaviour of a product, are they, are they professionals in the supply chain affecting the safety properties of a product? They're certainly professionals, uh, they're certainly affecting the safety properties of a product. Are they in the supply chain? Well, questionable whether they are in the supply chain for the product. Um, so it's an area where uh, we have existing definitions that have stood the test of time and by and large work pretty well for traditional products, but once we start introducing some of the new digital technologies, um, once we start connecting products to each other in a much more significant way, um, and uh, once we start thinking about the way in which products may, may learn themselves um, and process uh, information available to them to, uh, to create behaviours, product behaviours that are, are not necessarily planned by the manufacturer, uh, who, who are the people that are going to be that should be held responsible uh, to stop bad things happening in the first place, and who are the people who should um, have to pay the bill if compensation needs to be paid because something does go wrong? Another question that arises that um, uh, that's particularly interesting is um, uh, what about responsibilities through the product life cycle? Um, and again, with traditional products. Uh, it, it's all pretty straightforward. The manufacturers, the producers, should be responsible for ensuring the, sa the product is safe when placed on the market. Uh, that concept of safety needs to take into account foreseeable risks that might arise through the, through the product life cycle. If the manufacturer um, uh, gets that wrong and markets a, a dangerous product, then they have responsibilities to get out there and do something about it. And Paolo's given us a, a great summary of how that operates within the European regulatory regime. Um, but it does start to get a little, a little bit more complicated when we start to think about the implications of, of new digital technologies. I mean, for, for a long, long time, we've lived in a world where um, uh, manufacturers of, of computers and, and, and that type of equipment will, um, will, will sell us a computer and then from time to time, uh, sorry, sell us a computer with an operating system. Um, and from time to time, uh, there, there may be some um, uh, need to provide updates to the operating system as security flaws are identified or performance flaws, flaws are identified and the, op and the um, uh, producers of the operating systems will, will send out security updates from time to time in order to protect your data and, and stop bad things happening to your data. And um, we're all, we've all become quite used to that and there have been issues that have arisen from time to time and will still arise as to what is the extent of a... Uh, um, uh, the producer of the operating system's responsibilities to continue to do that well after the uh, well after the consumer has paid for the paid for the software. Um, now, yeah, that's that's an interesting debate from a consumer rights point of view and an important debate from a consumer rights point of view. Uh, but it starts to become a bit more real where that starts to have safety implications. So when when we start to think about uh, not just whether my data might be secure and I might lose everything on my hard drive or worse still, my personal data may be shared with someone else. They're, they're real issues and important issues. But once we start to factor in scenarios in which cars may run off the road, uh, kettles may explode, um, where there may be sort of real, real 
uh, imminent safety issues are raised, raised by security flaws, uh, then um, the, the conversation moves to, a, uh, to yet, yet another level and it raises, uh, I think, more acute questions as to what is a producer's responsibility to continue to provide software, software updates because the, the reality is that um, with the best will in the world and with all of the ingenuity in the world, um, uh, you know, it, will, it will always be the case that the producers of the software will write uh, really robust software that will be as robust as possible on the day it's released. But there are some very clever bad people out there, um, the, the cyber criminals who will constantly work to find flaws uh, that were not foreseeable at the time and, um, and identify vulnerabilities in what seemed to be perfectly good software at the time at the time it was um, put on the market. So there will always be a need, and I think we all accept that, for um, uh, the possibility of security patches and updates to software to keep ahead of the, uh, to keep ahead of the criminals that, that are out there seeking to exploit those vulnerabilities. Um, but when it comes to products and safety, how far does that go? Uh, uh, are, we, are we going to say that manufacturers need to um, be, be prepared to send out security updates indefinitely for the full, full life cycle of the product? Nobody seems to think that's, that could be right or that could be fair or that that could operate in a fair, in a fair way in the real world. So how do, we deal with the, how do we deal with that responsibility? And this is a real issue now for, for manufacturers that are putting products out there that you know, manufacturers um, obviously want their consumers to be safe. Um, uh, but there are questions as to what is their responsibility to actively monitor uh, the software, the use of the software in very, very old products and, and then uh, for free of charge or for a fee or what's the right solution uh, to push out security updates if security updates are needed uh, to that software over time. And what is their responsibility to monitor that over time? Yeah, I think um, yeah, we'd accept that for a period of time uh, manufacturers should take, some, should take responsibility for that in the marketplace, but if it's not indefinite, then where do we draw the line? And is it the same for every product? Um, um, and is it the same for every company? Some interesting questions that, uh, that are starting to emerge, starting to emerge in the real world, and companies are asking these questions and, and wanting to work out what's the right procedure and policy to put in place. Um, no real answers are out there um, for the most part. And so underpinning all of this and all of these sort of interesting questions that companies are trying to grapple with and, um, um, uh, and policymakers and regulators are, are, are equally trying, trying to grapple with, um, we, yeah, we're, in the, we're in the middle of, a, the, of what I see as a dilemma. I mean, industry is moving ahead very quickly with these technologies. That the technologies are, technologies are being uh, developed and brought to the market right now, and the pace is quickening, the rate of development, development is speeding up. Technologies that maybe we only dreamed of three years ago are now a reality and a normal part of our everyday lives. Advancement, advancements that might have been unimaginable five years ago are now becoming part, part of our lives. And the reality is that regulators and policy makers cannot keep up with, with, with the pace of change. Um, and frankly, there are no prospects that, that uh, we can expect uh, those in the position of um, responsibility for, for policy and regulation will be able to truly keep up with the, with the pace of change of, of this technology. And industry knows that, and I think generally policymakers and regulators know that that's the reality. So, um, uh, so some other answer is needed or some, some change of approach is needed to ensure that we all get to the, the right result, and frankly, the right result uh, uh, that we just hear repeatedly is uh, that, that I think is sort of universally accepted by all the legitimate stakeholders, by the governments and the policy makers and by industry, is that we want a world where good technology is allowed to flourish um, and, um, and, and innovation is encouraged, uh, but in a way that keeps consumers safe and keeps the world safe. Um, so there's a, there's a general acknowledgement that these technologies are going to make the world a better place um, and, and in many, many ways make the world a safer place um, uh, if, if we get it right. Um, and the technologies need to be encouraged, but, um, uh, but at the same time it needs to be done in a way that keeps, uh, keeps the market safe and keeps consumers confident in the markets, which is something that's very important for industry as well. And that's one of the, and, and so this, this is sort of a common problem shared by all legitimate stakeholders, that um, the policymakers know, sense that there's a need for a response. Um, and industry currently is operating uh, in many of these areas without without guide, guideposts or without safety rails uh, to help guide industry as to, uh, to work out what is the, um, 
uh, uh, what are the right decisions to be made about sort of safety and performance uh, that's going to be acceptable to the regulators in the future and going to be acceptable, acceptable in the market. So that's, that's one of the issues we're, we're grappling with. And, and, there, and as I said, it, it does mean that there needs to be a different approach. It's not an area uh, where um, we need sort of uh, government to sort of jump in quickly with, with strict regulation to put, you know, to put um, uh, clear barriers around what should and shouldn't happen because the chances of getting that right here and now in, in the right space of time just seems to, seems to be zero. Uh, so that's why we're seeing uh, uh, quite a lot at the moment uh, in Europe and around the world uh, an emphasis on collaboration, uh, collaboration between governments and industry to try to find the right solutions to this. Uh, a lot of talk about self-regulation uh, and how do we build a system of uh, self-regulation that, that everyone can trust. Uh, the use of soft law and guidance, as I said, and to the extent that a regulatory response is needed and we need changes to regulation to do that in a flexible way so that we don't box ourselves into a regime that's going to end up stifling good innovation and making the world a poorer place for it. And the great you know, risk for industry, and what the reason industry is, is concerned about this is because um, there is a risk that if uh, all of this doesn't fall into place in the right way, then there could be a lot of money and time spent on investment in technologies now that could um, be killed off by a regulatory response uh, that's inconsistent with the expectations of industry. Uh, so that's why there is a very much a, um, I think, a sort of shared objective amongst the policymakers at industry to find a way to build some guideposts around the development of the technology uh, that's going to meet all of the, those objectives that, frankly, um, everyone shares. You know, one of, one of the um, uh, sort of burning questions, for example, is, is what does safety look like with some of these new technologies? Because these new technologies, they're, they're unprecedented, they're doing things uh, that uh, we've not had to experience in the world before, and in some cases they're creating risks that we've not had to account for or, or deal with in the past. Uh, and so, you know, a question arises as to um, how do we... Um, you know, how do we build the right guideposts around, uh, uh, around the assessment of risk and the assessment of what's an acceptable level of safety for something that's very brand new? Um, and yeah, just to think of sort of one example um, that I'd like you to think about to help put this in perspective, uh, put yourself in the position of a regulator and you're faced with the decision as to whether to allow an autonomous vehicle uh, onto the roads. Uh, so you, you have a proposal for an autonomous car and, and the decision is, is this acceptably safe uh, to be put out there? And it seems to me you've got three choices in terms of your overall uh, um, uh, assessment, or assessment of that question. Uh, do you say, okay, I'm only going to allow the product out there if, 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 if the manufacturer can prove to me that it's risk-free? Or do I say, okay, um, I will only allow that vehicle out there provided the manufacturer can prove that it is no riskier than, it, than the cars that are already out there. So if it's, if, it's, if it's as safe as the other cars out there, then I should allow that technology onto the market. Or should you go the third option and say, no, I think we should only allow this new technology if it delivers some sort of improvement in technology. So we're going to do a bit of a show of hands. Who thinks we should only put it out there if it's risk-free? Who would say equivalent safety, number two? Okay. And who would say we need some sort of improvement in safety? Okay, so I, I didn't see any hands out there for number one, and I saw yeah, uh, uh, two and three seem to sort of you know, you know, be the popul popular choices. The problem we have is that the reality out there is that policymakers and in some ways the public are shifting towards number one. That it's um, uh, so we have sort of a clash in terms of what instinctively we think is the right approach to delivering new technologies that are going to make the world a better place. Uh, but um, you know, a, a single accident in an autonomous vehicle does sort of threaten the, uh, threaten the, sort of the whole program, as it were. Um, and, that's, you know, and that's one of the real problems, because it's a problem of not only regulator response and the regulator attitude to all of this, but it's a problem of public perception and public acceptability. Um, and so as we move forward with some of these technologies, um, frankly, the world, the policymakers, industry, and the consumers are going to have to get their head around, around this, that this is not going to be risk-free, some of these things. Uh, that this technology will make the world a better place, uh, but we need to work out what are the right rules that won't necessarily guarantee no risk at all, but will place the appropriate guidelines around what we do.
Another fact that we're seeing with these new technologies is um, what I think of as a convergence of risks. Some of the old distinctions that we've, um, we've thought it were significant in the past from the point of view of regulation and liability and, and sort of general uh, policy um, are not so real anymore. So we, we've spoken about the, uh, uh, the role of software and the distinction between software and hardware. And is, is that a, a, a real and meaningful distinction anymore? That's becoming blurred. Um, to me, another very important traditional distinction that is now making less and less sense is the distinction between safety and privacy. Um, and um, a, a lot of what we're talking about is, is all about data protection. Now, normally when we talk about data protection, at least historically, we're thinking of protection of privacy fundamentally. Uh, but data protection now is a much more uh, um, uh, ephemeral um, concept. Uh, and particularly when we start to think about cybersecurity and the importance of cybersecurity when um, these technologies are controlling products, uh, then a breach of, d of data security for a connected product can become a safety issue or can become some other issue that affects consumer rights in a way that is not about their privacy, but about their personal, personal safety. Uh, and so those concepts are, are starting to merge. Why does that matter? Well, it, it matters a lot at the moment, because at the moment we have different streams of policy makers developing rules. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the policy makers developing rules around privacy are, have, are moving well ahead of the policy makers developing rules around safety. But sooner or later, those policy streams need to, need to converge. They need to hit the same point because they hit the products at the same point. So companies that are sitting there designing products and designing software and trying to um, work out what are the rules they need to comply with um, uh, need to take into account both the expectations of the, of the privacy regulations and the expectations of the safety regulations and build all of that into the same product. So if the policy makers don't get some sort of consistency, um, consistency here, then we're going to be left with sort of inconsistent regulations and unworkable regulations that are not going to help anyone. So that's one of the challenges we face in the world, that, that problem, um, um, frankly, with, with jurisdiction. Um, and um, uh, and yeah, e even, within, even within the safety world, we have different, different streams, uh, different um, functions within the European Commission thinking about safety and writing rules about, thinking about, writing rules about safety. Uh, around the world, we have the same thing happening. We have, um, you know, in the United States, there are, there are all sorts of um, jurisdictional issues between the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Federal Communications Commission and various other agencies uh, where nobody seems to really know who, who, is, who is in charge here, who's, who's actually going to be responsible for developing a co coherent policy uh, that ensures that um, these um, parallel issues, they're not competing issues in any sense, but they're parallel issues that need to be considered actually end up with a coherent set of rules that actually makes sense in industry so that we can um, achieve those objectives of getting the good products out there uh, and having the world benefit from the new technologies uh, while ensuring that it's a world uh, where consumers feel uh, safe and confident um, with the, the products and the technologies uh, available to them. And finally, on the same theme, um, as I started off by saying, this is a, this is a global issue. So that's, that's the other challenge, that, um, that um, policymakers in Europe can um, uh, continue to lead the world in, in developing policies um, uh, and guardrails for industry and guidance and regulations that, that help the development of this technology and achieve those objectives. Uh, but it's going to make little sense if there isn't some sort of consistency uh, with this on an international level. Uh, so if the United States comes up with a different and inconsistent set of rules, uh, that's going to make the world a poorer place. And, uh, um, uh, and so yeah, the, more than ever in this area, there's a, there's a driving need for some sort of international cooperation. And I think you know, generally the policymakers you know, within Europe and in uh, other parts of the world recognise uh, that there is that need uh, to have some sort of international consistency. It's not really a time for competition to uh, rush to be the, the first and the, um, the loudest regulator. Um, uh, but, uh, but of course, um, uh, perhaps more and more in the world we're living in today, the chances of full, full international co collaboration uh, may not necessarily be great, but it is certainly one of the challenges. And, yeah, and there, are some, there is some work being done in that regard. I mentioned the OECD. Uh, it's a very important forum for international cooperation in this area. Um, uh, uh, is looking very much at, you know, at, at issues around new technologies and safety regulation with a view to trying to ensure some sort of consistency um, in the way in which um, uh, the way in which policymakers um, uh, respond to some of these challenges we've been speaking about. 
So what is the way forward? Well, the, yeah, the fundamental question for, for regulators is, um, are we moving into a world where we need a whole, a, whole, a whole set of new rules? Do we need to rewrite the product liability directive or do we need to write a new product liability directive for new technologies? Uh, that sits alongside our existing set of rules. The same with product regulations. Do we need a regulation on artificial intelligence? Do we need to regulate the IoT as a thing? Um, or, is it, or is it a situation where actually the rules will evolve? And um, there are some who say, and I, I tend to agree with this, that um, our, our laws um, sh by and large show great flexibility and our courts sh by and large have shown great flexibility historically in adapting uh, well-established rules to meet the challenges of new technologies. You know, the, uh, um, uh, and and in, you know, in, in many ways I think there is a lot of scope for the existing rules that we have to be uh, to be adapted um, uh, to take account of some of these challenges without necessarily having to sort of rewrite, rewrite the whole thing simply because some of this new stuff is complicated or difficult to understand. But at the, at the, at the heart of it, this is sort of one of the burning questions that, uh, that is going to persist for a while as to whether we need a whole, a whole set of new technology rules um, around, around this or whether we use the existing frameworks and, uh, and find the right ways to adapt the existing frameworks to make sure some of these wrinkles that I've been describing um, can be dealt with. Um, uh, so as, as we're thinking about how to, um, uh, uh, how to deal with this, um, just a, a few points that I think are important. Um, one is, yes, for, for some of the problems I've been describing, um, uh, when industry, for example, is thinking about uh, how do I work out what's the appropriate, uh, what are the appropriate parameters for safety for my, for my piece of new technology? Uh, there may be comparators that can be drawn from, from other areas. Um, and I think you know, one of the obvious things that I see happening is um, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, answers starting to be developed for some of these issues within the automotive industry for autonomous cars. Uh, where yeah, there, there, are, there is some sort of real tangible work going into how do you de define concept and how do you define who is responsible for a connected product. Um, and, and in the world of drones as well um, is another area. In both of those areas, things are the regulatory space is moving uh, very quickly to find appropriate solutions that enable the technology uh, because they are two areas where we need regulation. There's, there's no question that um, when it comes to autonomous cars, uh, that's an area that, that needs to be regulated so and practical solutions have to be found fast uh, without, by perhaps not doing regulation in the traditional way but finding other ways to solve it and, and, finding up, and finding ways to develop rules to help industry comfortably do what they need to do so that they can develop, develop a motor vehicle that can be out on our roads in two or three years' time um, uh, that everyone's going to be comfortable is going to be out there. Uh, the drones is the same thing. There's an obvious need to, to regulate what's above our heads. Um, and, uh, and so it's another area where the need of the industry is very much driving policy responses that are going to develop rules. And it may well be that those rules then um, in set uh, guidelines for how we can develop similar rules for other connected products, other autonomous, uh, other autonomous machines, uh, and other aspects of artificial intelligence because, because we get examples set within those two very particular industries. Um, Another important theme is engagement. As I've mentioned, there is a, a strong impetus in Europe and around the world for engagement. Uh, the uh, policymakers and regulators want to engage with industry, um, and industry sees the need to bring regulators along, along as, they, as they develop their technology. And I think that's a very positive thing, that there is that, that strong emphasis on engagement. Uh, and I think for, for stakeholders, you know, for industry developing, uh, developing technologies, um, monitor what's going on, keep a close eye on it because it's moving fast at a policy level, just as it is at a technology level, um, and take the opportunities to participate because it is a, an environment at the moment where um, the regulators and policymakers want to listen to industry and, and take guidance from industry. Uh, and, and so those are real opportunities that I think are very important at this point of time. Um, uh, and, and just on the theme of um, um, monitoring and um, uh, being aware of what's going on, just a, a, a quick plug, I think, for an important event that's happening uh, in Brussels next week, just as an example of an environment where some of these discussions are taking place. Um, um, it's the European Commission's International Product Safety Week. It's uh, the best part of a week of, um, um, of really good discussions with, frankly, policymakers from around the world are going to be in town. Um, and... and um, uh, and uh, the, there are sessions organised by the Europe, European Commission and by ICFSO, the 
International Product Safety Organization uh, that are focusing on new technologies. Uh, so it's just an, I'm raising it now partly because I'm helping to organize it and I think it's important. Uh, but uh, it is a, an example of a forum where people can come and engage, uh, hear what the regulators are saying, hear from industry, and where there can be active discussion and how to deal with these new technologies uh, and try to find the right solutions to some of these issues. Uh, so, um, uh, interesting times. I'm really happy to take any questions or comments.